It is a real pleasure to be here today, uh, back in Barcelona, but for an entirely different cause. Um, the great thing about an event like this morning, uh, and really about the whole week, is that it brings together uh, two very different groups of innovators. You know, in the, in the business world, uh, you have entrepreneurs, and you have captains of industry, and they use their creativity to kind of unlock new possibilities in the commercial world, in a commercial context. And that's really important. It, it moves the world forward. I really believe in business as, as our best tool for moving the world forward. And then, of course, we have engineers, developers, uh, people who think in code, uh, who also use their creativity to unlock possibilities, to make things possible tomorrow that weren't possible yesterday. Uh, and these are the two groups that I work with every single day. Um, it's rare, though, that you'd find so many people from those two groups coming together in the same place at the same time to talk about new possibilities in business and in technology. And the reason for that is just the spectacular surge in prominence of Kubernetes uh, as the foremost way to do the thing that um, you know, both groups really believe is going to drive success for them. Uh, in the world of containers, which became spectacularly popular, Kubernetes has come to the center and occupied the center effectively as the way everybody wants to do containers. So this week is going to be amazing. Uh, you are going to hear about tons of technologies, uh, some of them justly famous, uh, some of them didn't exist last week. Uh, it is going to be a cacophony of technologies, for better or worse. Uh, and you're going to hear from a ton of vendors, also some of them justly famous, and some which didn't exist last week. Um, uh, and that's what makes this kind of event exciting. We know that this is the future. We don't yet know exactly how that future is going to work out. And this is where we figure it out. Um, and you're going to hear a ton of promises, lots of promises, uh, many from vendors. And a few of those might actually be true. Um, so I, I was delighted to get the invitation to uh, to speak this morning, um, and I thought, given that everybody is going to have so many different things on their minds, they're going to hear so many different things, what can I talk about um, which would be a little different from the sorts of messages you're going to hear all week long? Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to be the only vendor this week who strongly recommends to a crowd that they not use my product. So that may sound poquito loco, <laughs> but a little later today, I'm, I'm going to tell you not to use my product and exactly why it makes business sense not to use my product. So for me, the reason this is really an exciting week is that this is the biggest open source event in history. Uh, and uh, you know, I had the spectacular, the, the wonderful opportunity uh, very early in my professional career to be able to choose exactly what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was accelerate the world's move entirely to open source. So to see an event like this, to see the excitement, the energy, and the gravitational force around an event like this really is heartwarming. You know, the way I do that, the way I kind of engineer the acceleration of open source uh, a, a tide that lifts all boats, um, is through Ubuntu. Uh, and really in Ubuntu, you know, people sometimes say, you know, how did Ubuntu, where did Ubuntu come from? How did it go from sort of nowhere long after enterprise Linux had been formed to suddenly be everywhere? And it really boils down to three things. We do only three things, really, and we do them consistently again and again. First, we simplify open source. And then we secure it for the long term, and we invest in performance. And that's where we innovate. 
And the magic of that is that it essentially um, makes all open source from all of these extraordinary innovators and contributors, all of whom are brilliant or insightful in a, a very wide range of domains, it makes their life easier and it makes, it makes it easier for people to consume that open source. Simplifying open source isn't about dumbing it down. You know, when I, when I was trying to simplify access to space, um, a NASA astronaut said to me, you know, why are you doing this? You know, space is scary and dangerous and expensive. It should be, you know, a place just for the professionals. And I said, no. I said, simplifying access to space and making it cheaper is going to enable, or simplifying access to low Earth orbit and making it cheaper is going to make it possible for the really advanced people to go a lot further. And that guy is actually now signing up to lead some of the first human missions beyond low Earth, low Earth orbit in 50 years, right? Out to the moon and back to Mars. Simplifying things and making them cheaper dramatically raises the bar for the people who, 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 who want to go furthest and want to go fastest. So that's why the companies that um, really take the most, make the most sophisticated use of open source do it on Ubuntu. Uh, we did it first for the desktop. And that's why today, there's something like 10 times as many engineers who use Ubuntu as a workstation in banks, in aerospace companies, in automobile companies, uh, as the next most popular flavor of Linux. We then worked with Amazon on simplifying this new way of thinking about aggregated compute, the cloud. Uh, and so today, the vast majority of uh, public cloud workloads across all of the enterprises on all of the public clouds are using Ubuntu because we tried to find all the points of friction that would take those, that expensive talent and slow it down uh, and remove that friction, even if we had to completely rethink the nature of the operating system for this highly dynamic world. For me, that's fun, that's innovation, and it's satisfying to see how that ra raises the tide for everybody who wants to play in this new space. Then along came containers, um, and uh, you know, cloud changed the way we think about the data center. Containers are changing the way we think about the application. You know, Kubernetes is completely different to a cloud because the application is much more deeply woven into the fabric of Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is much more deeply woven into the fabric of the application. You can think of Kubernetes much more usefully as a message bus between the components of the application, setting standards for communication, interoperability, and so on. It's very clear when you look at the surging um, amount of R&D around um, meshes, service meshes. By contrast, you know, an application could be completely oblivious to the fact that it's running on a cloud at all. So this new wave represents something fundamentally different at the application space. But it's complicated. And a lot of those complications stand in the way of, of the real point of all of this, which is to make developers more productive, to make teams more productive, to bring the future forward faster. Um, so we chose not to try to build our own container orchestration system um, very deliberately, because we figured that open source would lead naturally to a consensus set of APIs. And today, I think it's very clear that's Kubernetes. We chose to focus on the points of friction in containers effectively underneath containers and inside containers. And so that's why today, if you look across the whole sort of Docker apocalypse, right, the, the entire landscape of all things Docker, um, you'll find the majority of, of what, what people put inside their containers is Ubuntu. And again, if you look at the many different um, uh, distributions of Kubernetes, the majority of them will use Ubuntu underneath, which creates this seamless portability and, and hy hybrid in, in interoperability and operations landscape, right? You really want to believe, it really needs to be true, that your developers can work on their, their workstation, they can build containers, they can move that to racks of VMware, they can then move that out to AWS, and that entire process should be completely seamless, enabling you to put your compute exactly where the data is, exactly where the economics uh, want it to be. Um, for me personally, I think the, the, the next wave is out to the edge, 
where again we're working with people like the Greengrass team at Amazon um, to simplify what's possible at the edge, right? Taking everything that we're learning from our data in um, giant aggregated um, uh, centers of compute and then pushing that out, pushing the lessons of that, the knowledge of that, the responses to that out to the edge to smart devices, whether they're self-driving self cars, whether they're better um, switches and routers, whether they are um, uh, 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 financial systems uh, monitoring transactions you know, in store, in retail environments. Um, it's all about effectively um, changing the nature of operations or, or, or bringing open source to the edge and changing the nature of operations to suit this completely different world. So the second big thing I talked about was making open source secure. Um, and we make a 10-year commitment to every enterprise release of Ubuntu. And the reason we do that is because um, uh, your legacy starts today. Almost everything that we build will stay in production, if we're successful, much longer than we imagine it's going to stay in production. And so to me, it's, it's simultaneously as important to help people go faster and get into production faster, try things faster, right? try the new thing faster, and to make sure that they don't have to go back to that thing because that is essentially a distraction from the real business of creating um, the new thing. So we make a 10-year security maintenance commitment to every major release of Ubuntu. We also invest uh, very deeply in proactive security, right? So you have reactive security, something gets discovered, something gets, uh, you know, a problem is discovered, and then it's a bit of a race to see both how fast you can make that fix available, but also how efficiently you can get that fix out, right? We actively measure the, almost the, um, uh, the penetration rate of fixes, um, because it doesn't help us if, if patches are available but they're not getting applied. Um, to, to the world's infrastructure. So we look at ways to essentially move fixes faster out into the wild, into the field, um, as automatically as possible. Um, but also the very architecture of the operating system enables us to, or th thinking about the architecture of the operating system enables us to mitigate future compromises. Um, thinking about an, uh, unlocking capabilities in the kernel and applying those to things like containers enables us to essentially make sure that when an issue is discovered, because there will be issues in code that we trust today, um, when issues are discovered, that the, um, the impact of those can be as tightly constrained as possible. Uh, in that, with that focus on security, I'm very excited to tell you that we will be bringing um, uh, our kernel live patching capability to the optimized AWS kernel. We've had uh, a kernel live patch stream for our general purpose kernel, which runs pretty much everywhere, um, for a long time. But of course, we also, together with Amazon, have a super optimized AWS specific kernel, which is very popular because it, it unlocks a lot of performance capabilities um, on AWS. Uh, and um, we will now make available a live patch stream for that dedicated kernel. Now, we're at a container summit, right? Why would people want to live patch a kernel? Surely, you know, we're in, we're in a world where everything is disposable in, 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 in a world of immutable containers. Well, in fact, we're going the opposite direction. If I look at the, the trends in the container world, they're all about figuring out how to bring traditional workloads, pre-container system workloads effectively into container operating environments. And so more and more people are saying, well, how can I run traditional workloads which weren't designed for the cloud or which weren't designed for containers, how can I run them in container systems so that I get this unified approach to all of my workloads, the, the re reducing the number of vertical systems as Bob described it earlier. Then the last thing I talked about was performance, really investing in performance. And the great thing for me about AWS is that it puts this laser focus 
on the economics of IT is a complete transformation of the way we think about technology to be able to really understand the economic consequences of different ways of doing something. Uh, and so performance takes on a whole new meaning when you're working in a cloud environment, right? It really, really brings home the idea that time is money. Um, if we can make the entire Ubuntu estate on AWS 1% more efficient, that effectively goes directly to the bottom line for both the users, the tenants of AWS, and the cloud itself, right? So there's an enormous emphasis now on finding opportunities, taking, taking the opportunity to really super optimize important workloads. The kernel, obviously, but coming up from that, things like machine learning frameworks, any place where people are gonna be moving large amounts of, uh, of data or doing anything that is performance critical or time sensitive. In that spirit, enabling GPGPUs, enabling ARM as an instruction set, for example. Um, uh, at the end of the day, the cloud does an enormous amount of work. Amazon does an enormous amount of work to, to make capabilities available. But tenants can often only or best consume that from inside a guest. And so connecting the dots there makes a huge difference. Which brings me to EKS and to containers. Now, this is where I am going to tell you not to use my product. And as a technologist, I've got to tell you, I love my product. We, of course, have an operations framework for Kubernetes. Uh, it's called the Charmed distribution of Kubernetes and uses charms to essentially handle an, all of the wrangling with all of the many different components uh, that go into a great upstream Kubernetes. You can, you can stretch it, you can place those components wherever you like, you can upgrade them whenever you want, which is um, super useful. Um, it lets you play with every possible permutation and combination of uh, container networking plugin or a storage plugin. Um, and it wins rave reviews from people who are kind of grappling with complex Kubernetes topologies. But really, you shouldn't use it. And the reason for that is that complexity has a cost. Uh, and you should never impose that cost on yourself. Really, you should never impose your, that cost on yourself. And it's one of the, I think, the, the big mistakes that technologists tend to make, because to them, that complexity is fun. That complexity is about having options. That complexity is about the future and learning, right? But it very quickly turns into cost. It turns into cost and friction for everybody else. So even though I would say the charmed approach to Kubernetes is a technological tour de force, uh, and it makes a huge difference in places where complexity is inevitable, places like telcos uh, or in regulated environments where they've got very complex security operating constraints and you know, so the complexity is necessary there. For everybody here uh, who's on Amazon, that complexity doesn't make sense. And you should be using EKS. Um, the vast majority of people on Amazon who want to do Kubernetes should be using EKS. And I say that simply because in the end, my commitment is to the best, most efficient, easiest, open source way to get things done. And very clearly, Amazon is committed to, to delivering that with EKS. Uh, so what I want to say today is that we, Canonical, are committed to working with Amazon on EKS to bringing all the things that we're famous for to EKS. Um, simplicity, simplicity of operations, Simplicity of integration with all the other kinds of things that people want to mix into their worker nodes. Um, security, the long-term commitment to being able to own and operate infrastructure for a long time, right? And performance, all of the benefits of the work that we do together to super optimize workload performance, super optimize the, uh, the worker performance, the kernel performance underneath it, to EKS. So you might think, okay, 
that makes sense, right? Kubernetes is sort of a commodity, right? Kubernetes is essentially the, uh, very well standardized, very conformant from every manufacturer. So using uh, a single platform Kubernetes, that, 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 that maybe makes sense. But actually, I want to go a little further for the business people in the room and talk about the cold economic argument for adopting things on your cloud which are unique to that cloud. And people often recoil from this, they sort of say, oof, that smells like lock-in, right? Now, I should be clear, this is not a paid message. I wasn't asked to talk about this. This is the advice that I give companies that I invest in, right? And the reason behind it is very coldly economic, right? Relationships are expensive. Relationships have complexity and consequences, and therefore great relationships, deep relationships, are few relationships. You know, true relationships are few relationships. If you grew up with Facebook, maybe you think you can have 5,000 friends, but life's not like that, right? When businesses engage with a cloud, they have to in integrate an enormous number of things. Identity, billing, operations, performance management. The observability of the stack, effectively, for your business on a cloud is going to be unique to that cloud, right? Yes, there are things that you can get from clouds, which are substitutes, but the relationship with the cloud is unique. And so it's really important to choose carefully and choose wisely. I think if you're here today, you chose wisely. Good choice. You're never going to find, there is no, no bigger cloud ecosystem than the Amazon cloud ecosystem. But I wouldn't hesitate, really, I wouldn't hesitate to go very deep in that cloud ecosystem and use the capabilities that are unique to the clouds that you have dived into. OK. As a closing thought, let me say, as a technologist, we love to feel like we're doing something new. We love to feel like we're doing something fresh. Um, and we've developed a whole language for that, you know, agile, minimum viable product, pivoting, right? It's all about essentially making quick, sharp, short-term decisions that accelerate you uh, into the future. But we should be very clear that those quick little projects for today, um, that abandonment of legacy effectively back in the old data center is really also the beginning of a new kind of legacy, right? The things we do today will be your successor's legacy. So that's why I think it's really important to be aware of that, right? Um, you can't avoid making mistakes. But you really can realize that everything you build, even if it's just supposed to be in production for, for a week to prove a point, right? If it works, someone's going to say, you know, ship it and build the next thing, right? Today we are building the legacy of the future. We should be wise about that. Um, thank you very much. Have a great day and an outstanding week. Thank you. I was told not to leave the stage. <laughs> Craig, why don't you come on up? All right. Craig is, I should say, now the VP. Uh, I don't know, what, what, what are you VP of at VMware? Uh, is my mic working? Oh, there we go. There you go. Uh, VP of Research and Development in the Cloud Native Apps Business Unit. Right. And uh, one, of, one of what we call the three amigos of Kubernetes, one of the three founders of Kubernetes. So it's really All awesome. Right. awesome to have you here. Thanks very much. Well, before I get going, um, it's a great opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> so Bob, um, we talked a lot about that sort of you know, true to upstream vision of EKS, right. Right? the commitment to upstream uh, Kubernetes. I guess I'd like to ask a question in a couple of parts. You know, um, 
you know, how true to upstream is ZKS really? And um, as you start looking at this sort of getting into steady state, you know, obviously it's a service that's been growing over time. How close to those upstream releases are you going to be able to stay? You know, like how long would you expect the gap between Kubernetes release and EKS right. accepting that technology? Yes. Uh, well, we are. Maybe it's maybe it's worth just reiterating, and it's been an amazing lesson for me in a customer obsession. A customer obsession to be working in AWS, and I know if you're outside, if you've ever been a customer like I have been in the past, you get some appreciation for that. But it is amazing how deeply that principle is embedded into everything we do. And customers have told us over and over and over again and are very consistent in telling us, don't fork, stay upstream. And so that's where all the energy really comes from for us to do that. As long as that is true, there is no reason why we would do otherwise. Um, if customers actually started telling us you should fork Kubernetes for some reason, we would probably go and do that just because we're going to follow the customers on this. Um, but customers are very, very clear on that. So that's part of what we have to do is we have to deliver that. Um, I think uh, we have certainly not uh, gotten releases out on EKS that match upstream as fast as we all want to. Uh, and we are very dedicated to closing the gap there. But we won't close the gap in any way that we feel like compromises operation stability or security. And so, you know, an example of this is when we, we, were, we were on track to getting 112 support out on EKS uh, considerably earlier than we ended up launching it. And we, the version of Kubernetes that we were going to initially, the ver upstream, we were gonna stay upstream and uh, there were just some things that we needed that were in one of the point releases that we felt like we had to have in order to ship it. And so we ended up shipping it pretty late uh, as a result because we needed to wait and we needed to make sure that it was right so that when that version was out, we were sure it was good. So I think uh, we are definitely operating on those principles, which means we're probably gonna continue to be a little bit conservative, maybe a little bit slower. But I think that all our customers understand that we're doing that because we're being, we're being careful and thorough. And uh, that said, we're gonna, we're gonna try to keep up and go faster. A lot of the work that we were doing with uh, some of the, one of the folks from the Mike Crude, raise, raise, your, raise your hand over there. So uh, Mike Crude is one of the folks on our team who does a lot of the upstream work, is very involved in the cloud provider work. Um, if you're interested in AWS cloud provider stuff on, uh, on Kubernetes, go find, go find Mike during one of the breaks. Uh, we're working in that area quite a lot to try to decouple some of the AWS uh, specific code that's inside Kubernetes, which will help us go faster. And we're working on the drivers to help us go faster. So there isn't just a single answer there. We, we have to do a whole bunch of things in, at once. So, awesome. Well, Mark, great. since Thanks. you're up here, um, I mean, you've been pretty close to open source for a little while. Um, you know, obviously, Kubernetes is a, is a relatively new community. I mean, we're five years in, but it still feels pretty fresh. Um, do you have any key lessons that you've picked up through your journey of democratizing access to Linux and you know, sort of working in this type of ecosystem that you would like to pass on to the, uh, the Kubernetes community and things that you would, you would like to see us really sort of focus on as a, as a collective? Yes, I, I think actually the Kubernetes community has already um, uh, done a really great job of, of internalizing some of the, the, the challenges that we saw from the days of the early days of Linux and then um, you know, other big open source ecosystems. Um, I see a very deep um, focus and commitment in the Kubernetes leadership to um, API conformance testing, which I think really goes a long way towards addressing the concerns that people have um, around fragmentation. Um, uh, and, and that really is the, the sort of concern that I run into. You know, people want to work in a hybrid world. Um, they want to use platforms like Amazon um, deeply, um, but their develop, development and test may not be on Amazon, for example. Um, and so um, we do find that there are lots of subtle complexities in achieving that smooth portability, um, which is why I think it's super important for us to work with folks like EKS, because if that is gonna be the 
cheapest place for people to put a container, then I, we should make it as easy as possible for them to put the container there, no matter where it got built. Um, those subtleties don't tend to be, I don't think, in the Kubernetes APIs because of this very widespread commitment to conformance with upstream version releases, but rather they're in, they're in subtleties of essentially the application, the build process there, and the kernel in the build environment and the kernel in the, in the, um, in the production environment. Those are the, where those two sort of worlds come together. I think we will also see that, that world getting more complicated, right? We look at, you know, if you look at the world of GPGPU acceleration, uh, there's some sort of tricky lies being told to your, to your software. Um, the, the, there's obviously hardware somewhere in a server, even in a serverless environment, right? There's hardware somewhere in a server. There's a kernel on that hardware, which is a driver. That there is then some software running in a host operating system, uh, and that is being then quietly injected into a container. It wasn't there at all when the container was built. That's being quietly injected into a container to bind at runtime with the software that you built on some workstation or build farm, uh, quite possibly on the other side of the planet. Um, getting all of those lies to line up effectively um, requires a lot of sort of detailed work and coordination. And that's really the business that, that you know, I think we have to focus on, enabling all of the different platforms, um, uh, VMware, AWS, to offer that true portability for this new world of containers.